as you can see, I'm sort of going to follow up some of the earlier discussions that we had yesterday about how we can make economics not only useful, but think about what students are generally concerned about, the objections that they usually have about how economics doesn't represent the real world. Simply put, we can think of behavioral economics as the intersection between economics and psychology, or the economics and sociology, a lot of things like that. But basically, what behavioral economists are doing is they're challenging that rationality assumption. And rather than trying to come up with models starting from that rationality assumption and seeing where we can get with that, we're saying instead, how about we try to understand how people actually think, how people actually behave when they're faced with decisions involving money, involving resource allocation, and so on. So we can think about, well, what does rationality actually mean? Because we're not entirely good at defining this for our students. And I notice that a lot of my behavioral students get confused because they say, well, we're talking about specific ways in which people are irrational, but we never explicitly talked about what it means to be rational on a detailed level. And of course, you can think about being rational as being long-term utility maximizing. That's usually where we stop with that definition. But then you can drill down and say, well, what does that actually mean? Well, if you're long-term utility maximizing, you've got to be able to process all the necessary information about everything you could possibly be consuming in the world. You have to be able to do that costlessly. You have to be able to do that without being biased. You have to not be subject to framing manipulations. You have to have one giant lifetime utility function. You can't be thinking about things day by day. And when you start breaking this down, we're like, wow, there are probably you know, seven different things we could put under that assumption of rationality. But if we're starting to outline that assumption, we can see more clearly how that gets broken. And we can get beyond just this notion of you know, economic rationality being this picture of, this is my favorite example of the rational economic man. We have Spock here. And we can get beyond just saying, oh, he makes good decisions. And that's a very dangerous way to describe rationality, actually, because good decisions has like a value judgment component. So we can think about, well, why do these matter? You know, one of the things when posed with this perceived threat, if you will, from behavioral uh, economics, traditional economists will say, well, we don't actually assume that everyone's behaving perfectly all the time. That would clearly be silly. But have you ever considered the possibility that if people are making mistakes, that at a market level, at a country level, at an economy level, these sort of cancel out? That it's just noise. We'd still basically get to the same equilibria. We just have these you know, mistakes canceling out across consumers. Now, the problem with that is that you know, if you think back to our world of pop economics books, for example, you've got Dan Ariely at Duke University that wrote an entire book called Predictably Irrational about behavioral economics, which of course suggests that these mistakes are not in fact random, that we can study them, that we can understand how people are behaving, and we can see some consistency in these biases across individuals. And if we see that consistency, then even when we aggregate up to the market level, we're still going to see those biases. They're not just going to cancel out. And they're likely to actually change the market outcomes that we're predicting based on our, base, um, our traditional you know, supply and demand model, et cetera. So let's talk about the cornerstone of behavioral economics. And we can think about this as coming out of a very simple thought experiment. You can say, as a step one, I'm just giving you $1,000. And then I ask you, you have two options. One, we can flip a coin. If the coin comes up heads, I give you another $1,000. Okay. Yay. If the coin comes up tails, I just don't give you anything else as a follow-on. We could do that. Or I could just hand you another $500. Now I'll give you another thought experiment. So now I'm just going to give you $2,000. And now I'm going to give you a choice again. Again, the first one, we have some uncertainty. I'm going to flip my coin. If that coin comes up heads, I'm going to take $1,000 from you. If the coin comes up tails, I just won't take anything from you. Your other option is that I take $500 from you for sure. Now the interesting part is that almost every group that I do this with, whether it's random people, whether it's economics graduate students, you know, we sort of divide people into categories of people who should know better and who shouldn't know better. Regardless, the result is very, very consistent. And this is the, the result that's given in the paper that basically approximates every group I've ever done this with. So in the first case, most people want the $500 for sure, 84% of people. That's not in and of itself irrational. 
That's just saying, hey, look, people are risk averse over gambles involving money. We already knew that. But now if we look at the other one, most of the people want the gamble. We say, well, that's interesting because all of a sudden it seems like we've gone from some degree of risk averse to some degree of risk loving, but it gets better. Think about not segregating these two steps. You know, I purposely called this a step one and a step two. Let's put them together. Let's do some addition. The first question, if I took the gamble, I'm either getting, at the end of the day, when I combine everything, $1,000 or $2,000. You agree that that's true? If I don't take the gamble, I get $1,500. It's easy enough. But check this out. The second one, if I take the gamble, I get either $1,000 or $2,000. If I take the certain outcome, I get $1,500. Mathematically, there is nothing different between the two questions that I asked you. And yet, we see people reversing their preferences. That's what we mean when we talk about irrationality. That we say, you're supposed to have this well-defined utility function. You're supposed to understand the numbers given to you. You're supposed to think in terms of final levels of wealth. So the crux of prospect theory says, well, if framing matters, how can we redevelop, for example, um, our model of risky choice? So for those of you who are teaching at the intermediate level, you say, you know, you're teaching intermediate micro, you say, well, we teach the model on the left, right? That we have this expected utility model, and we can come up with the expected value of a gamble. We can come up with the expected utility of that gamble. That model on the left has no way to explain the difference in preferences that we just saw. So prospect theory comes along and says, all right, we can do better. It seems like in at least some cases that we're looking at, people tend to perceive outcomes as gains and losses compared to some sort of neutral psychological reference point rather than thinking in terms of final levels of wealth. So we can say, all right, we're looking at gains and losses. We also notice that we have this S shape here. And we observe that people, when they're talking about potential gains, yeah, they tend to be risk averse. But when talking about potential losses, as we saw in that second thought experiment, they tend to be risk loving. And what we see, lastly, is that this realm of losses, the value function, which is the analog of the utility function, is steeper in the realms of losses than in the realms of gains. So basically what that's saying is that people dislike losses, big shock, but also that they dislike losses more than they like equivalent gains. So losing $100 is going to make you more upset than winning $100 would make you happy. And that asymmetry there is what's driving a lot of the behaviors that we saw in this thought experiment here and that we'll see in the slides that follow. So one of the things that comes out of this is we get something called the endowment effect. It tends to be the case that when someone's selling something that they view as their own property, that they generally demand a higher price to sell that item than on average they would have been willing to pay to actually acquire that item. And there are a number of different explanations for this. One potential explanation comes back to loss aversion. If it's more painful to give something up than it is pleasant to get something, we would need to be compensated more to give that thing up than we would pay to get it. So we need to actively think about what the implications of these findings are for these models so that we can you know, pull everything together, keep the student interested, get the students to understand, and also to practice saying, OK, we gave you a very basic model. Obviously, that model does not always perfectly represent the real world. Rather than throw it out, let's think about how to modify it because it's still useful, it just needs a few tweaks. So we'll talk about the endowment effect and the illustration of this. Early economic experiments were not always the most sophisticated things. And in fact, one of the first experiments talked about pens and coffee mugs from the campus bookstore. So consider this. Say we have 22 mug owners and 22 non-owners. I just made this super easy and said, let's imagine for the sake of simple supply and demand curves, that the valuation of the owners just ranges from 1 to 22, and the valuations of the, the non-owners range from 1 to 22 as well. And the owners are put in the position of, hey, do you want to sell your mug? 
and the non-owners are put in the position of, hey, do you want to buy them up? From this information, we can construct supply and demand curves, and we can actually figure out, on average, how many trades we would expect to take place. Because if people were rational, the mug owners, when asked, you know, what price would you require in order to be willing to sell, would be using that valuation as a willingness to sell. Right? So these are the numbers that would go and comprise the supply curve. In the other case, basically the valuations are being used as a willingness to pay. So these numbers are what would be used to construct a demand curve. And we would get something that looks like this. And what we would see is that technically speaking, if we made these smooth points, the equilibrium quantity would be about 11 and a half. But if you're going to think about trades happening as long as the buyer is willing to pay more than the seller is requiring to sell, we're going to see 11 trades out of this. So this is what we generally do. We can say, oh, hey, we have a useful example here. Unfortunately, this example doesn't match with reality. Because we can look at what actually happened in the experiment referenced in the source paper. And I chose 22 because they actually distributed 22 mugs to their students. So you can envision this as they randomly went around the room. And they said, OK, you get a mug, no mug for you. You get a mug, no mug for you, and so on. So because the mugs were randomly distributed, we would expect, you know, to some degree of statistical noise, the distribution of rational objective valuations for the owners to be about the same as those for non-owners, that there shouldn't be any you know, pervasive bias in one direction or the other because we randomized. So we would expect, in general, if we have 22 potential sellers and 22 potential buyers, based on the same logic that we just used, we would expect to see if people were acting rationally somewhere in the neighborhood of 11 trades. But we don't. We see that the number of trades is actually between 1 and 5, which is actually pretty far from 11. We didn't do a statistical test to see whether this was you know, far enough away to satisfy that you know, two sigma threshold. But this isn't looking good for the representation of this basic model to our current situation. And we saw that the median willingness to sell is much higher than the median willingness to pay. And it doesn't seem like students got the opportunity to learn. If you look at this paper, the students are actually asked to do this four times. And if it's just the students learning how to act in a market, then you would expect the number of trades to come closer to that rational number of 11 on the fourth child and of the first child. And that's not what the experimenters actually saw. So we say, well, this is vastly out of touch with what we tell students to expect to happen. That's a problem. So we can say, well, what do we need to know in order to think about how to build this empirical finding into our model? Again, not to throw it out, just to tweak it. The authors of the paper see that this irrationality seems to be on the part of sellers rather than on the part of buyers, meaning that the sellers are artificially inflating their willingness to sell rather than the buyers artificially diminishing their willingness to pay. So we can think about that. And it's like, OK, if I was going to modify this model, I'm going to have to be moving around the supply curve. That's what that would mean. We also see in these types of studies that the ratio of the seller valuations to the buyer valuations is around two. So what it seems like is happening is that when put in the context of the seller, the sellers are psychologically or irrationally inflating their willingness to sell by a factor of two. That's a pretty easy thing to depict on our model. Just do something like this. And in fact, you can go through and explain why the outcome, what I'll call you know, S sub-endowment, leads to an outcome more in line with what we saw empirically than what we would have called this S sub Spock, if we're going to have Spock as our rational economic man. It's entirely, you know, now it doesn't seem at all unreasonable that taking this S sub endowment, this psychological supply curve that people seem to be using rather than just looking at marginal cost, we would get a Q star that's far below 11, that this could explain why we're seeing the number of trades being between 1 and 5, and why we're seeing the price on those trades be above the average valuation of the buyer. 